Do you want to help strengthen this channel? It's easy. When making your purchases, use the provided links in the description of which we are affiliates. Every small gesture is very valuable to us. Say, look at it this way. Because uh, you can't really figure what all these people want. Look at yourself. Right now you're thinking you want to become an engineer. Let's say right now I make you an engineer, this moment. Then you're thinking you need a job, I got your job. Then you're thinking you need a promotion, I got you. Then you think you need an award, I got you. Then you think you need wealth, I got you right now. Everything that you can dream of, I got you right now. What do you want now? <laughs> yeah, I can do that for you. Huh? I'm striving for a job right now. <laughs> yes. Now, we are… we are looking at the end game, right? <laughs> you got everything you wanted right now. Things that you can imagine, things that you cannot imagine right now, everything you got right now. What do you want right now? <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do. Just look at it, huh? <laughs> See, when you say this, what it means is, all you want in your life, what you're seeking is struggle. To get a job, it must take three years, then you'll feel, wow, I got a job. <laughs> look at all the people who have good jobs, look at them walking on the street. Are they going blissfully, dripping ecstasy? <laughs> Hello? Miserable guys, they're getting blood pressure, going to work. They're getting all kinds of ailments, they're freaking out. Yes? So what do you want? Is there a girl here? What do you want? I don't know anymore. <laughs> That's good. I do not know I like that <laughs> because actually you do not know. Everybody keeps fooling themselves at every step in their life, thinking, what I want is I want to become an engineer, I want to become an engineer, it'll keep you busy for five, seven years. <laughs> then I want job, job, it keeps you busy for another one or two years. Then I want this kind of job, that kind of job, that keeps you busy for another eight, ten years. I want that much money, that much wealth, that keeps you busy for another twenty-five years. I want this kind of girl, that kind of girl, that kind of boy, uh, that keeps you busy for a few years. Then children will come, I want my child to become this, this, this. Well, we are preparing for your funeral <laughs> You need to understand, you need to understand just this. Right now, you may be giving all kinds of context to your life. But essentially, what you call as my life right now is just a certain combination of time and energy. Yes? As you sit here, time is rolling away for all of us. Can you roll it back? You're an engineer? <laughs> Can you roll it back? Yesterday was not fruitful, so I'll roll it back. Can you? It's rolling away for all of us. As we sit here, what is ticking away here is not the clock. What is ticking away is our life, isn't it? Since we came and sat here, you're half an hour closer to your grave. It doesn't matter how young you are, you are getting there, isn't it? Yes or no? So it's a certain amount of time and that time nobody can manage because it rolls at the same pace for everybody. You do something, you don't do anything, you sleep, you're awake. 
you are happy, you are unhappy, do whatever the hell you want, it just keeps rolling mercilessly, isn't it? So there is energy that you call as life. This you can pitch it at different levels. If you are like this, I am talking about the classroom expression, you know <laughs> If you're like this, twenty-four hours feel like thousand years. <laughs> but have you seen on a certain day you're very happy, twenty-four hours poof, went off like a moment? Yes or no? So, time is a very relative experience in individual subjective experiences. If you're joyful, if you live hundred years, it feels like a few moments, it's gone. Only miserable people will have a long life <laughs> Because if you're miserable, you'll always feel life is too long that you'll want to cut it short. But if you're joyful, the possibility that a human being holds, before you look around, it's over, really. But what possibility this carries? So what you need to manage is your energies, because life is a certain amount of energy, it's not limitless, but it can be enhanced. If you function at one level of energy, what you do in ten years' time, if you function at a different level of energy, the same thing you can do in one year's time. So if both people live for hundred years, in terms of impact and profoundness of experience, one has lived for a thousand years, another has lived for hundred miserable years. So this is all you can do. You may think right now, engineer, this one, that one, these are all limited contexts you're setting for yourself. Fundamentally as a life, it's just time and energy, isn't it? The question is what you make out of it. Do you want to make something out of it? There's no compulsion you have to make something out of it. When I say making something out of it is not a social phenomena I'm talking. What should you become in the society? That's not what I'm talking. Fundamentally, you have come here in terms of life is you want to experience life. Question is how profoundly… Right now, if people want to experience life, what are they experimenting with? They will experiment… not this, this <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know, I know you guys <laughs> Or they'll experiment this or they'll experiment something else. What they will experiment is how to down your faculties. You know, uh, United States has uh, made marijuana legal in a few states. So when I went to a few colleges or universities, they are asking me, Sadhguru, why don't you pitch? Someone like you must legalize marijuana for us <laughs> I said, no problem, we'll make marijuana legal, cocaine legal, meth legal. What's the problem? No problem. Only thing is, why is it that you want it to be legal so that you can smoke up and come to the college, right? It's fine. But let's say you want to fly a small airplane, the pilot comes smoked up. You want to fly with him? Ah. Because the guy is already flying without the airplane. Okay, you're not getting the point <laughs> You need a major surgery and the surgeon comes smoked up. <laughs> you want the surgery? Oh no! Then you clearly understand, this lowers your faculties. I want all of you to look at this. Do you believe you can enhance life by lowering your faculties? Hello?
If you want to enhance this life, you must super enhance your faculties. That's the only and only way you can enhance this life. You cannot lower your… lower your faculties and think your life is getting enhanced. What kind of stupidity is that? Simply because it makes you little like this. I can make you feel like this all the time, how's that? No substance, I am always like this only. Look at my eyes, I'm stoned. <laughs> yeah, never touch a substance but fully stoned all the time. <laughs> because I want you to understand this, the greatest chemical factory on the planet is here. If you are a good manager of this, you can create any experience that you want from within and also heighten your faculties. If you are having an experience, even to experience that, your faculty should be heightened, isn't it? Is this the great, greatest chemical factory on the planet, most sophisticated? Do you agree with me? Are they chemical engineers? <laughs> so I am asking, how are you managing your system? What have you done? We gave you such a sophisticated machine. Have you read the user's manual at least? <laughs> no. Blindly do this and then you think pumping something is going to make this better? No. Believe me, the only and only way you can enhance this life is that your faculties are super bright. The way you see, the way you hear, the way you smell, the way you taste and the way you touch, if this is enhanced, is life enhanced in many ways? There are much more to it. But I'm saying from what you know from your experience, suppose you could see twice better than somebody who is sitting next to you, is your life enhanced? Hmm? If you could taste better than other people, is life enhanced? If you could feel better, is it life enhanced? If you could hear better, is life enhanced? On this level you understand this, but there are many other dimensions of human faculties. If you enhance this, if you sit here, you will be blissed out simply sitting here. You wouldn't want to touch any damn thing because just sitting here is the greatest experience of your life. So, about what is the end game? If you had everything, what would you want? If you had everything that you can ever dream of, everything is right here, what would you want? <laughs> you must think, isn't it? I won't supply you with an answer. If you do not invest that much thought into your, li into your life, that means you're super short-sighted. This happened to Gautama the Buddha. You heard of Gautama the Buddha? Because of some astrological prediction that his father heard that he may either become a great emperor or a great sage and he wanted him to become a great emperor, he protected this boy and put him in a separate palace where it's all luxury, everything that you can dream of, everything there, got him married to a very pretty young woman, everything on. No, he should not see any suffering. But one day he just went out. He saw one old man and he asked, Why is this guy like this? Uh, you know, his chauffeur. His chauffeur or his chariot driver said, Oh, everybody becomes like that after a certain time. He said, What, me? I'm a young prince. Will I become like that? Hey, yeah, everybody will become like that. He shook him. Then he saw a man who's suffering with some kind of disease, ailment. Why is that guy like that? Said it'll happen to a lot of people. Who it will hit, there is no prediction. Anybody can become ill. Most people think it happens to other people. No, it can happen to us. Hello? And then this, he saw a funeral, a dead body. What is that? He said, that is inevitable, everybody will die. Do you also know? You will also die? No, because most people believe other people die 
No, intellectually they know, but they think they are forever. No, you must be conscious, you are mortal. Mortal means you have a limited amount of time and energy. If you are always conscious about this, how would you organize your time and energy? You decide. You are conscious about it. If you think you are a superhuman being, you are not going to die, other people will die. All the best. <laughs> It'll come. You can realize this on your deathbed and die. See, people may think this is extreme, but you must go and volunteer in a hospice or in a hospital ward where people die and you must see, it's very important, very, very important. Only then you become sensitive to life, life becomes super valuable because you know it's a limited amount of time. If you watch this, unfortunately today in the world, over eighty percent of the people when they… last moment when it comes, when they die, they are not fearful, they are not in pain, they are not in something else, they're just bewildered. A look of bewilderment comes because all their life they just lived their thought and emotion, they never lived a life. This is important, you must understand, there is a psychological reality in your head and there is an existential reality which is life. Most people are mistaking their psychological reality to be existential. Your thought and emotion has become more significant than the cosmos, isn't it? Hello? Huh? What you think, what nonsense you think and feel, has it become more important than the universe or no? This means you are making your creation more significant than the larger creation, this means you must suffer. If you don't suffer, I'll be disappointed. Yes, I will be. Because if you live… if ignorance doesn't make you suffer, then what? Then what's the use of me? <laughs> because it takes a lot to come out of the trap. What is the use of somebody striving to come out of the trap of ignorance? When people can live wonderfully in their ignorance, what is the point? What is the use of knowledge? What is the use of knowing? What is the use of enlightenment? What is the use of realization? If people can live absolutely blissfully in their ignorance, what is the point? When you're ignorant, you must suffer. And I want you to know, the greatest evil right now on the planet is not evil, it's ignorance. See that there was… there were many signs of opening, walls were coming down. Uh, many initiatives were taken to open up the world, which I think uh, brought many benefits. If we look around the world now, there are many signs of closure. Walls are being constructed, there are many policy measures being taken by many governments, closing borders, closing borders to persons, closing borders to goods. I wonder if I may ask how you see all this? See, uh, yes it's true you're seeing that as a global situation, but we need to understand this, bringing down walls without bringing down economic disparity is not going to work. When we brought down walls, then itself we should have understood that we must strive to bring down disparity in the world. No man or woman wants to leave their home and go somewhere else to some strange land and live there just for survival. Nobody wants to do that. But… but it is uh, estimated that in the next decade, there could be about 1.7 to 1.8 billion people moving or migrating. When that many people start migrating, your wall is not going to work anyway <laughs> Wall… wall will work 
world will work when they're in a few thousands, maybe a million, but when they go to a billion, your wall is not going to work, it's going to be a tragedy because now you see a stream of people coming. Well, can every nation just open up its borders and say, welcome, live on the streets? Not possible, yes? So the thing to do is, which I've been striving to do and I've failed to do is, in the last twenty-five years I've been trying to bring some key people in the world together so that this initially we started as onepercent.com uh, and I try to create a board and every time we are about to do it, some warlike situation comes and some nations back away and it never happened, all right? The idea was just this, one percent of what we invest in our defense forces, as we call them, arms and armaments, what we invest. If we contribute and we institute a board of people who are from responsible businesses to be given as soft loans to these businesses to start enterprises in improvised societies where it's not profitable to do business. A business will naturally try to do business where it's most profitable. You cannot ask them to go and do business somewhere in one corner of Asia or Africa because they are looking at their profitability. Essentially this is… this attitude is because money is expensive. The money is expensive. If you give them a softer money which is not expensive for a gestation period of twelve to twenty years and very soft kind of cushion for them to develop an enterprise, develop the talent and create industry and business in improvised societies, the reason for these people to migrate will go. Instead of making that investment, you invest in putting up walls, uh, you will see walls will work to a certain point. I'm not even saying it's wrong because the sovereignty of a nation is essentially determined by the geographic borders. I'm not saying every nation can open up and let people inside, it's not possible to do that. But you will not be able to control it this way, nor is it very humane to do it that way. So the only way is, in some way we must see how economic disparity is lowered. We cannot level it absolutely, it's very, very far away leveling it. But if we strive in the next ten years, if there's enough investments going into various parts of the world from where people are migrating, if you start businesses there, if you start enterprises there, if you start economic activity there, then the need for them to go elsewhere to make a living could be reduced and migrations could be controlled uh, because nobody wants to leave their homeland if they can make a living there. So if I may turn to our audience, the first question uh, is from Jitendra Khanna, uh, who comes from, who is an ex-WHO employee. Uh, and the question is, physicists have concluded as of now that the universe is deterministic. So is there free will for humans or is free will an illusion? See, right now, all of you sitting here, whether you sit here in a pleasant manner next to the person who is sitting next to you, or you abuse them, or you stab them, or you throttle them, is it by your will or is it by some universal law? <laughs> I'm asking. Hello? Is it yes. by your free will yes. or no? whether you look at them wonderfully or you look at them nasty, is it by free will or is it because of something else? The way the planets are spinning. Lot of people thought so forever. Because people think they are the way they are because of the way the stars are moving right now. Unfortunately, a whole lot of stars they're looking at don't even exist. They're gone long time ago <laughs> but they're determining your future and your life. So, uh, there are… I see many Indian origin faces. 
In India, we have something called as karma. Today it's become an English word. In the Oxford English Dictionary, it is an English word. So I can use this word. <laughs> karma means action. Action means this. When you sit here, your body is doing its own things, it's acting, that's why we are alive. Mind is doing its own things, our emotions are doing its own things, our life energies are doing their own things. Every moment of your life, in wakefulness and sleep, these four dimensions of activity or karma are happening, isn't it? Hello? Yes. From the time you woke up today morning, to now, whatever number of hours, if you are a twelve o'clock person, it is just uh, six hours. <laughs> if you are a six o'clock person, it is twelve hours. In this twelve or six hours that you've been awake, how much of your physical, mental, emotional and energy activity has been a conscious process? Hello? How much do you think? Believe me, it's le well below one percent. So when ninety-nine percent of your activity is unconscious, obviously you think something is hitting you from elsewhere <laughs> If you make ten percent of what's happening in body, mind, energy conscious, suddenly people around you think you're a superhuman being. Yes, people think you're superhuman, you're determining everything. If one hundred percent it is determined by you, they'll start worshipping you godlike. Because all that happened is, you became more conscious. And the significance of being human is that we can be conscious. See, if you look at the nature and activity of your life, you're not very different from other creatures on this planet. You're… they are born, you are born, they eat, you eat, you grow up, they grow up, you sleep, they sleep. You reproduce, they reproduce, you die, they die. It's just that they do it more gracefully, you do it with lot of fuss <laughs> So, your… your activity and the life that you do is not very different from other creatures. Only thing is, we can do the same things consciously. That's all the big thing about us, isn't it? Hello? Yes. That is all the big thing about us. We can eat, sleep, reproduce and even die consciously. This is the big dimension of being human. So if you do not exercise this one thing, it is an evolutionary problem. You're going backwards in evolution. The life is striving to go forward. This is not your or my intention. Life is naturally striving to move forward. When you were a monkey, I'm sorry, this is not my statement. <laughs> uh, Charles, that Englishman, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Darwin said this, when you were a monkey, you did not desire to become a human being. But the life within you is longing to move on to the next possibility. Out of that we are a consequence. Hello? So the consequence is not of physical super capabilities as uh, Hollywood movies are trying to show. Essentially the consequence is we are more conscious. Because physically if you become let's say far more capable than a chimpanzee or far more capable than a cheetah or a panther or something, you would just be a super animal. You became human only because you became more conscious than other creatures. If you do not exercise that consciously all the time, uh, you will fall back in no time. Thank you. Uh, so now we have a question from Nilofar Bawa, former employee of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, uh, Tuberculosis and Malaria. What is the future of our planet? We are running out of water. The glaciers are melting. What happens when we run out of water? Will mankind and life go extinct on Earth? We are not running out of water. Million years ago, how much water was there on this planet? Still the same amount of water is here. 
Only if some men go off to Mars, they will take some water and go. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, the same amount of water is here, it's not gone anywhere. It's not where you want it. That is something that you need to look at. Why is it? Why is water going away from human habitations? Why is it lodging itself somewhere else? Obviously, we are not living the way we should live. Very simple. Hello? We always went in pursuit of water. Where there was a river, civilizations developed. But now water is trying to move away from us. We must be doing something fundamentally wrong. Hello? Isn't it? We are doing something very fundamentally wrong in the way we are organizing human habitations. We need to look at this seriously now, very important. Otherwise, you have to go and live under the ocean. Because that's the only place there will be water <laughs> Thank you. So I stay on water, and this one comes from Sasang Pai, a cognizant. I came to know the Isha Foundation through Rally for Rivers. Uh, please could you enlighten us on the possibility and progress and how we can contribute? Oh. Uh, I think they showed something on the video mm -hmm. for, about Rally for Rivers. We made a 760 page policy recommendation as to how Indian rivers should be managed. Because on an average, all Indian rivers on an average have depleted about forty percent in the last seventy years. Some rivers have receded over sixty to seventy percent, major rivers. We must understand this, the European rivers are of a different nature and Indian rivers are of a completely different nature. Here, largely, the precipitation comes in the form of rain and also snow. And glacial water is probably the main source. I believe about fifty-five to sixty percent of European water uh, rivers are coming from glacial waters. In India, only four percent of river water is glacial. Rest of it is forest-fed. River is not the source of water in a tropical land. Riv river is a destination into which the water comes. The only source of water we have is monsoon. And this monsoon pours down in forty-five to fifty days in a year. What comes down in fifty days, all in the form of water, not in the form of snow, because snow will pile up and stay for two months and slowly melt and trickle into the land. That is not how monsoons come. Monsoons come like a torrent of water, all liquid. So how do we hold it? We were holding it because there was substantial vegetation everywhere. So vegetation and the richness of the soil held it and slowly let it go in the form of streams and rivulets which all joined together and became a river. But we have removed green cover in such a way, if you have flown over India, if you fly from Delhi to Chennai or Bangalore, if every five minutes you look down, it looks like one brown desert except for the western guards and a few patches here and there, rest is all farmed totally. Because there is no vegetation and there is no richness in the soil, we are not able to hold the water. When the rains come, there is flood, otherwise there is drought. At the same time, at the, at the upper regions of the river, there is flood, the lower regions of the river, there is drought in this, at the same time, at a given time. This phenomena is happening mainly because of removal of vegetation. To what extent? Means you must understand this. For example, Ganga Basin, where it accounts for twenty-five percent of India's geography, thirty-three percent of India's agriculture, we have removed ninety-two percent of green cover in the last sixty years. What's the plan? So, Rally for Rivers mainly is pushing towards putting back at least one-third of the green cover back on the Indian subcontinent. So right now, as a sample of that, we are doing one short river which is fifty-four kilometers, which unfortunately became notorious as uh, the suicide capital of India, which is called as Yavatmal in uh, Maharashtra, where maximum number of suicides happen. Almost every third family we meet has had a suicide in their families. So, we have taken this up hands-on project where recently the cabinet approvals have happened and we are working on the ground. 
our volunteers are meeting every family, 9600 families in the Yavatmal region are being contacted and given a cell phone number in case of any distress, they can get back to us. The fundamental is to change them from regular farming where there is no scale. They're just scratching land which is two acres, three acres per family. They cannot invest enough in a two acre land. If they invest, they become debt ridden and drives them towards suicide. So we are seeing how to make them an integrated way of approach and also towards agroforestry which will revive the river. A larger project that's coming up which all of you can participate in whatever way you can because we need a big push for this is called Kaveri Calling. Kaveri is a river which flows mainly between two southern states, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. These two states have been at war with each other as to who should drink more Kaveri water. See, if there were two glasses of water for both of us, we will drink our water and be nice to each other. Suppose there's only one glass of water between the two of us, we're nice people but we'll fight. Yes or no? Probably. But yes, I'm sure you won't. <laughs> <laughs> no, if there's no water, I will also fight. <laughs> I'm saying people will fight, isn't it? Because of scarcity, people will fight, even nice people will unnecessarily thrash with each other. This is what has been happening. Here we have removed eighty-seven percent of the green cover. Kaveri is very dear to me because I grew up around this river. Once I floated down this river for thirteen days on just four truck tubes and a few bamboos. I lived off the river. In my experience, I never saw this river and fantastic forest that was around as natural resource. I always experience this as a life larger than myself. It's a much bigger life than you and me. And it has been there before you and me and it should be there be after you and me. But right now we brought it to a place where it may not be there. What's been there for a million years may not be there for the next generation. We're bringing it to that place. Right now the scientific studies show Kaveri has depleted forty-six percent, but I don't agree with this because they are taking the monsoon flow also as the volume of water. If you leave the monsoon flow, if you just go and see the river after October, in my eyes it seems like it's twenty-five to thirty percent of what it was when I was a child mm. around that place. So it's depleted so sharply, it's been uh, troubling me. So now mm. we are doing this. This is a... this is a rally of a different kind. The rally for rivers was purely an awareness because river is a concurrent subject in India between the central government and the state government. We wanted to bring that concurrence which we managed for the first time. These sixteen states at that time were ruled by six different political parties. For the first time, they came together on one cause. Otherwise, opposition parties have always been, you know, whatever one says, the other will say just the reverse of it. This is how it's been. But they came together and spoke in one voice, which itself was a tremendous thing. Mm -hmm. It showed the maturity mm -hmm. that there is, in spite of the daily fighting that happens, when real issues come, they stood up and stood up for one cause that was fantastic. Hundred and sixty-two million people supported this cause in thirty days' time. I personally drove 9,300 kilometers, 142 events. Literally, we were on the road thirty days non-stop driving and talking ourselves hoarse. But this did the job. Now, the Rally for Rivers recommendation became the official recommendation for the twenty-nine states that the government sent this as an offi official recommendation. Three to four states are very proactive. They're going and doing their own thing, which is very good. Another six states, we've signed MOUs. But now we need a large-scale demonstration. See, the important aspect of this is, we are shifting farmers from three-month, four-month crop pattern to agroforestry, which will multiply the farmer's income. Right now we have transformed 69,760 farmers into agroforestry, and their incomes have multiplied five to eight times in a matter of ten years' time. So this multiplication of income will happen. Why I'm saying this is, this is an economic plan with a significant ecological impact. Mm -hmm. That is what is important because the moment you talk ecology, all the businesses become cautious because these guys are going to come and bash us. 
All ecologists or ecological activists always trying to hit some industry or some business. So this is what I want to change and this is what we have successfully changed is economy and ecology have to go hand in hand. If you put… pit one against the other <laughs> if you pit one against the other, economy will win hands down, ecology will be battered. So that is what has been happening, especially now in India, because we are looking for an economic surge. We are talking about becoming a five trillion dollar economy. When we go like this, there is a possibility ecology could be trampled. So we are working with the governments because it's very, very important. This is something always, at least in India, the people who represent ecological uh, concerns have never worked with the governments, always mm. against the government. Mm. If you're serious about doing something, you have to work with the government. There's simply no other way. Well, there may be compromises because they have their own concerns, they have their own political and budgetary issues and various other dimensions are there, not just some ideal that we hold. So this is a new trend that we have created that ecological concerns are not of… people have always treated like this. Economy is today's concern, ecology is tomorrow's concern. I'm saying ecology and economy are today's concern and they have to go hand in hand. So if you want to support in some way, Kaveri Calling will start in September. Just to tell you how it is being done, we are… Uh, this time we are on a motorcycle. A group of us are riding down 1500 kilometers, nearly 1500 kilometers down the river, camping on the river, creating about 35 events along the way. We are asking for the governments to give an incentive for farmers to shift from regular farming which destroys river and uh, uh, terrain into agroforestry. This is yet to happen, both the governments are examining the budgetary proposals that we have given. Whether it comes through or not, if it comes through, we will go propagating the benefits the government is offering, the incentives. If it doesn't, we use it as a people's movement to push the government towards that policy. But this has to be done now. What I see is, if we don't do this in the next twelve to fifteen years' time, I think uh, particularly southern region, uh, right now it is the most water-distressed region is uh, Tamil Nadu and it's also entering Karnataka in a big way. I think uh, it, it's a clear manifestation, we don't care a damn about our children and their children, how they live here. It's a very clear statement as far as I'm concerned. I don't want to leave that statement. Mm. Thank you. <clears throat> so this takes us, this question takes us more explicitly to uh, yoga. Yoga seems to be the current buzzword, from exercise as asanas uh, to meditation for body and mind well-being. How exactly do you define yoga? Oh. I thought we've done a plenty of that, yoga yes. means union. Even the chant we did was just that, mm -hmm. you do it somehow, okay? You do it with austerity or you do it in a pleasurable way, you do it sitting alone in a mountain or you do it being with everybody, somehow. How the hell you do it, it doesn't matter. Somehow you should become like this, that if you sit here, your experience of being alive is fantastic. Nothing need to happen. If you sit here, you're alive and it's fantastic. Is it… let me tell you this. Right now, what is the most important thing in your life? Your bank balance, your business, your family, your relationships, what you're planning or you're alive right now, which is most important? Hello? You're alive right now, that is the most important thing, isn't it? So you do this much, I'll teach you a simple yoga right now. Tomorrow morning, if you do wake up <laughs> See, you think it's a joke. You're thinking it's a joke. No, mortality is not a joke. This is the problem with most people. Most people think other people die <laughs> No, you and me will die. Hello? You and me will die, isn't it? I'll bless you with a long life, but still you die with a blessing, isn't it? <laughs> Mortality is a real thing. Every day, 
and nearly quarter million people don't wake up tomorrow morning, huh? By natural process. So in case you wake up tomorrow morning, check if you're still alive. If you are, will you give yourself one big smile, you're still alive? Hello? Hello, will you do that? And And uh, every day if quarter million people die, at least five to ten million people would have lost someone who's dear to them. You check those five, ten people who matter to you, if they're all alive, will you give yourself one more smile? Hello? To yourself, not to somebody. All of them are alive today, all the people who matter to you immediately, will you give yourself one more smile? It is uh, seven o'clock and you're still alive <laughs> Please understand this, what is ticking away is not a clock, it's your life which is ticking away. Since you came and sat here, you're two hours closer to your grave. Hello? Yes or no? Mortality is a real thing. If you're conscious of it, then you will make the best out of this. You think you're eternal, then you live like a fool. You have time for all kinds of idiotic things. If you know life is ticking away, you will do the best things that you can do, isn't it? Hello? You will not do the best thing, you will do the best things that you can do. And this is all we can do. In your life, if you do not do what you cannot do, that's not the issue. But if you do not do what you can do, you're a disastrous life. So yoga means to avoid this disaster. So, uh, this question takes us to education and it comes from Minakshi Bana of the Bluebell School International in New Delhi. What can schools do to inculcate ethical living in a joyful way? The moment you have lot of ethics, your face becomes long <laughs> because I, it's like this. Let's say there is an ethic, thou shall not kill for me. So I'm just holding my hands back, but I want to kill. <laughs> but why do I want to kill? Why… why is it that I want to kill? We must look at it more fundamentally, isn't it? Rather than stopping it with a value that I set for my, no, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. See, please understand this. Just try this right now. Shall we try an experiment with your mind? Next thirty seconds, Nobody should think of a monkey <laughs> Try. Please close your eyes and try. Oh, only monkeys, isn't it? <laughs> this is the nature of your mind. In your mind, if you say, I will not, only that will go on. Why are you making life so difficult? Why do you think you are born wrong and you have to be fixed. No. You think creation has made a mistake with you? Hello? You think creation has made a mistake with you? No. It's fine, the life the way it is, is fine. You become something because you imbibe all kinds of nonsense from other people. You call this religion, you call this education, you call this morals, you call this values, you call this philosophies, ideologies. For religions and ideologies and philosophies, we have killed more people than for crime, isn't it so? Hello? Mm, absolutely. Mm. So, all these morals, ethics, values, philosophies, ideologies are only an effort to prevent crime. but. In the end, these preventive measures have caused more death and horror on this planet than crime would cause, isn't it? So why do you think I would like to steal what is in your pocket? I don't care, first of all. Why are you telling me thou shall not steal? I… I never thought of stealing anything <laughs> from you <laughs> All this… 
All this comes because you are in pursuit of happiness, that's the problem. Have you seen every one of you, when you're very joyful, what a wonderful human being you are? But if you're a little angry, frustrated, miserable, you're nasty, yes or no? So this is what we need to create. We have been always trying to produce good human beings, which is a terrible mistake. We need more joyful and sensible human beings. This is what yoga is about. <laughs> Joy is an insurance. Joy is an insurance. When you are joyful, you want to kill somebody? Hello? <laughs> Only when you are miserable, you want to kill somebody, isn't it? Uh, thank you. Now, I think if I'm reading, we're coming to it, maybe we have one last one, perhaps? Okay, uh, there are many, many uh, questions, but a last one from Hiran Jani, a biz. Uh, spirituality, and I think you've just been addressing this to some extent, spirituality and religion often, um, are often misunderstood at all levels. How could you explain the difference and the overlap in easy to understand terms. Spirituality and? And religion. Religion, okay. See, if you say I'm religious, you naturally identify yourself as a believer, isn't it? Hello? That you believe something, whatever that is. What is belief? Let's look at this. Something that you do not know, you assume. And if ten of us assume that, this is my religion. If in this culture, we have never had one authority to spread spiritual process, because this is the only culture on the planet without a religion of its own. So Hindu is essentially that culture which was born out of the river Indus is called Hindu. So it's a geographical and cultural identity, never was a religious identity. It's only when people came from outside who came with concretized ideas of religion, they had to give you also one name. So we are this, what are you? We are all over the place. They couldn't understand that. You must be something. In the same place, a million things existed together. In the same house, if you are a family of five, five of you can worship five different gods and have absolutely no problem about it. <laughs> we didn't even think it's a problem till people came from outside and told you our God and your God. Till then we did not even think it's a problem. You could be worshipping this God right here, I could be worshipping that God right there, another could be sitting with eyes closed, another could be singing, another could be dancing, but we still thought it's all okay, everybody can do their thing. So there has never been a religion in this land. We have thirty-three million gods and goddesses. That happened when our population was thirty-three million. <laughs> now we are one point two billion, but we lost our creativity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because outside forces came, particularly Western forces came and they started making, a feel, ma making us feel ashamed of our gods. Too many gods. Well, there's only one god, as if it's a superior idea. If you can create one, why can't you create a million? You have not seen your one god, right? If you can create one, why can't you create a million or a billion? It's just a question of creativity, isn't it? So does it mean to say nothing beyond me exists? That would be a stupid way to conclude. As you sit here, you know you did not create yourself, yes or no? Can you digest your food or digestion happens? It happens. Are you breathing or breathing happening? 
Are you beating your heart or is it beating? I can go on to your liver and kidney and everything, even to the spleen. Even the tiniest thing in your body, you're not running it, isn't it? It is happening. Are you spinning the planet or is it spinning by itself? You doing nothing. Doing nothing, dead, just tidbits, everything vital is just being done. Yes or no? Everything that's vital to life is being done. You just have to sit here and just enjoy the spin. <laughs> For that, how many problems <laughs> So, this is a land which clearly understood God is our making. That's the reason why in this culture God is not the goal. Mukti is the goal, liberation is the goal, ultimate freedom is the goal, God is never the goal. Yes or no? You don't like it because you've forgotten. <laughs> Otherwise, mukti, mukti is the goal, isn't it? Mukti means what? Liberation, freedom from everything, including God. <laughs> you are using God as a stepping stone if you need it. You can grow with God or without God. This is the only culture on the planet where in any of our Indian languages, there is no word for a heretic because we never thought anybody is a heretic. We never imagined that there can be somebody like that because we did not have any established belief system, everybody can do their own thing. Most plural and democratic process for thousands of years. So, the spiritual movements were started for human liberation. This is not about God. Nobody in the planet, no human being is interested in God, please understand this. People are interested in God because they believe he's a solution for their life, isn't it? Yes or no? You think if you go to God, all your problems will go away, your health problem will go away, your mental problem will go away, wife and husband problem will go away, you, you can pass an examination without studying, you can… you can succeed in business without working, so many things, incredible things. But it's about you, isn't it? Yes or no? It's about you. So when it's about you, we were straightforward enough to address it straight. We said this is about our liberation, this is about our well-being, this is about our ultimate well-being, not just immediate well-being. So this is a culture which looked at it this way. So it is a complex array of spiritual movements. Many have died, unfortunately. In the yogic system it says, when… when somebody asks Adi Yogi, how many paths can be there? He says, if you use your system and go, there are only one hundred and twelve. But if you go beyond your system, how many atoms are there in the universe? That many doorways are there. So we gave the freedom to create your own God. There is something called as Ishta Devata. You can choose your God. If you don't like any, you can create one. Yes? You suddenly like the tree in your house, you can start worshipping. Nobody in this country will think it's funny or weird. Anywhere else if you do it, you will be… they would be burnt alive, but now they will throw stones at them across the fence because they think you're a heretic, you're worshipping a tree. You like a stone in your garden, you can start worshipping that. Nobody thinks anything odd about it, it's perfectly fine. Because there is not a single atom in the existence without the hand of the creator in it. Every cell in your body is doing complex activity, not because of you, isn't it? The source of creation is functioning through that. Every atom, all this complex moment of proton, neutron, electron happening, you doing it? The hand of the creator is very much in it, so every atom is a doorway to the beyond. Because of this, 
So many varieties of spiritual moments happened. It's unfortunate so many have died in the last hundred years, so many. But still the variety is fantastic. If you… how many of you been to place like, places like Kumbh Mela and things like that? You been to Kumbh Mela? The big one that happened in Allahabad, have you been to that? Hundred and… after hundred and forty-four years, it comes. If you go and see there, you must go, you will see India, okay? An India of another dimension, which today the educated population in the country are completely missing. It's incredible, incredible, I'm telling you. People are putting their last penny and traveling from somewhere just to be there for two days and go. I'm saying it's that level of people, where hundred rupees would mean like what a million would mean to you, that's how much a hundred rupees will mean. That kind of people putting everything that they have, they come with their families just to be there because somebody has told them on that day if you take a dip you'll attain mukti. Not that you'll see God, not that God will come and give you a heap of gold, you will attain mukti. Still eight hundred million people in this country are actively seeking liberation, knowingly or unknowingly. It's an incredible thing, nowhere else on the planet there is such a phenomena happening that there are human beings longing to go beyond their present level of existence, consciously. Nowhere else such a thing has happened. When Mark Twain visited India, he spent uh, two and a half to three months in India, there's a book about his travels. Along the equator, he traveled around the world. So, uh, he said, anything that can ever be done, either by man or God, has been done in this land. This is one of the best compliments India has ever received. And that is so. In terms of understanding the mechanics of how a human being is made and what we can do about this, Nowhere else has anybody looked at it with the profoundness that it has been looked at it in this culture, nowhere else. I'm not saying this being biased that I'm born in India so I have to boo-boo-boo. This is not about you being Indian or not Indian. This is about a profoundness of knowledge which is gone awry, you know, lost its tracks or losing its tracks slowly. Unless we put it back on the right thing, Humanity will lose something tremendous because today we know how to call on the phone and talk to somebody in America, but we do not know how to communicate with this one yet. Our communication technology, information technology has hit the ceiling, but what information do you have about the nature of your own existence? Nothing. We know how to do many things, we can go to the moon, but you don't know how to simply be here. So, this technology of inner well-being has been explored with as… you know, absolute profoundness. This knowledge should not be lost. Only if this knowledge flourishes on this planet, material and economic well-being will translate into human well-being. Otherwise, you will have everything and you will have nothing. Just to give you an example, what's happening to India right now? The last year, 2011, when the Diwali came, we call it Deepavali. When the Deepavali came in South India, about 127 crores worth of alcohol was sold on one day in Tamil Nadu. Out of this, Twenty-one crores worth of alcohol was sold in one small town where a population is about six to six point five lakh people. Why means, this is the Tirpur town, you heard of Tirpur? It's a Hosairi town, it's an export-oriented town. Everybody here, their incomes are at least three times that of everybody else in the state. So if money comes, they're going to get drunk and stay in the gutter. Forty-two percent of the Tamil Nadu's population is going diabetic. So if money comes, you will buy disease. So if economic well-being does not translate into human well-being, it's meaningless. 
Moving from poverty to affluence is a hard journey. Whether it's for an individual or a society or a nation, it is a hard uphill task. After you get there, the deception of it, uh, you work hard all your life and get there and all you get is a disease, all you get is addictions, all you get is misery, all you get is broken minds, all you get is stress. It is a great deception. So when people achieve economic well-being, human well-being also should happen. If this has to happen without an element of spiritual dimension in them, it cannot happen. They may be following an organized spiritual process or by themselves they might have found something. But without an element of spiritual process, there is no way anybody can translate economic well-being into human well-being. This must happen. As economic development happens, it is very important parallelly spiritual possibilities are widely available to every human being, otherwise life will deceive you in such a bitter way. You cannot overcome something which does not exist. Right now, are you in fear? Right now. That I may say something damaging. <laughs> Is it the fear? <laughs> Every moment of your life you're in fear? No. So, when you're not in fear, just stay like that. Because to create fear, you have to use excessive imagination. To not be in fear, you don't have to do anything. Fear is happening because of excessive imagination, things that have not happened, you're creating. What may happen in your mind happens in thousand different formats and most probably it never happens. The things that you feared, take hundred things that you have feared, probably ninety-nine of them never happened, isn't it? Yes. So your fear, your fear is always about that which does not exist. You cannot fight or you cannot overcome that which does not exist. We can overcome something with that exists. You cannot overcome that which does not exist. You just have to give up that effort. Enjoy the fear. After all, it's your making. You like horror movies. Yes, uh, I mean, you're saying no, but you're, you're producing them. It's just they're not making money, that's all. Fear means you're producing horror movies in your mind. Nobody else is willing to watch. That's bad for the producer. But you're producing them. So, you produce something else. Produce a comedy, a love story, suspense, thriller. Try and see, today, just sit down, produce a love story, a suspense thriller, a comedy, five, five minutes mo movies you make in your mind, really. Start using your mind differently, it's just gotten into your pattern. Just gotten into your pattern of just creating horror movies all the time. You have watched enough horror movies, they're boring. Create something else. <laughs> Even it's not that if you produce these movies, those things will happen in your life. Still they may not happen, at least you enjoy the movie. <laughs> in reality it may not happen, so what? At least you enjoy what's happening in your mind, if you cannot enjoy what's happening in the world, isn't it? That much privilege every human being deserves, isn't it so? Even if the world is not kind to him, at least his own mind should be kind to him, should produce some nice movies. <laughs> the word engineering essentially means to make something happen, 
something that we want, we will make it happen in the most efficient possible way. That's engineering. If you're doing it in horribly inefficient ways, that cannot be called engineering, isn't it? We will say this is a fine piece of engineering. When something that we want is happening with least amount of friction and with least amount of consumption. So if you have a body that if you use it for twelve hours, it sleeps for another twelve hours, it needs twelve hours of maintenance. Sleep is maintenance time, you know. If you had a car that you use it for fifteen days, fifteen days it's in the garage, it's better to take the public transport. Now you have a body which has to sleep ten to twelve hours a day. Now this is not an efficient system, it's not being managed properly. Probably the fuel is not good, maybe your engine is leaking. So is this all physical, no? Maybe medically you have been certified fit, but still, if you need to sleep eight to ten hours, which unfortunately people are saying, qualified people are saying is standard that every human being must sleep eight to ten hours. That's a horribly inefficient perception of what a human machine is, isn't it? This is the most sophisticated machinery on the planet, this human mechanism. If this mechanism is made such a way that half the time it's in maintenance, you cannot call it the most sophisticated. It's very simple. I will give you simply three things. Just do these three things, you will see your sleep quota will come down dramatically. Very simple things. Extremely simple things that you just do for ten, fifteen minutes a day you will see your sleep quota will come down dramatically. I'll give you something else, another three things to do, very simple things. You do this, your food quota can be brought down to at least thirty to forty percent of what you're eating. Still maintain your weight, maintain much more activity than you're maintaining right now and with much less sleep. So, you engineer something because you want to run it more efficiently. Running something inefficiently is not engineering. So I'm a mother, I have a job and I have things to do, whatever you are, it doesn't matter. Whatever you are, it's important, whatever the nature of your activity, you are doing something because you think it's important for you. If you are doing something that's important for you, if you think your work is important, the first and foremost thing that you should do is you should work upon yourself. Inner engineering is a systematic way of working upon yourself, not just in the body, not just in the mind, not just in the emotional level, but all aspects, your body, mind, emotion and energy, if all these things are aligned and organized properly, this machine will work so much more efficiently. So the amount of sleep that you need, the amount of food that you need, the volume of rest that the body demands can be brought down considerably. At the same time, the volume of activity can be greatly enhanced and made more efficient and more effective, especially if you're a mother. Your responsibility is not just for making your life work well. Now you've taken the responsibility of making one or two more lives, their lives to work well. When you dare to take such a responsibility, I think you must do inner engineering. There is no choice for you. If you are not a mother, you could choose maybe. But if you are a mother, you have no choice, you must. Sadhguruji, then what is it? Uh, okay, so for all of us, what, how do we live our days? What is the best way to just go about it? 
give us in clear simple simple sentences do this and you will be at least on the way to being blissful or happy or aware or living in a nice conscious way if you if you just observe if everybody makes an little effort everybody take a little time for this piece of life okay not for your family not for your career not for something else something else just for this piece of life give it little time because this is the most important piece of life in your life isn't it yes or no <laughs> even if you're in love with somebody still this is the most important piece of life isn't it so pay some attention to this how does it happen why have you taken it for granted believe me you're not going to be here for ever i'll bless you with a long life but you're going to fall dead one day <laughs> yes or no yes so do not take this for granted if you wake up in the morning tomorrow if you wake up in the morning <laughs> no this is not my wish <laughs> but i want you to know of all the people who go to bed tonight over a million people will not wake up tomorrow morning and tomorrow if you and me wake up tomorrow morning is it not a fantastic thing a million people did not wake up you woke up is it not a great thing just look at the ceiling and smile you are still awake you're still there and for many many millions of people somebody who is dear to them did not wake up so just check those five six people around you they all woke up wow it's a fantastic day <laughs> you woke up and everybody who matters to you around you woke up yeah. is it not fantastic day yes you don't think so yes <laughs> yes you don't seem to think so <laughs> yes because the problem is just this you are living with an idea that you are immortal when i say you are immortal you are not actually thinking you are immortal but you are not conscious of your mortality if you are not conscious of your mortality somewhere you think you are immortal isn't it how many moments in a day are you conscious that you are mortal if you were conscious would you have time to crib would you have time to fight with somebody would you have time to do some rubbish with your life if you knew if you are conscious that you are mortal you would do nothing other than what is absolutely needed for you and everybody around you this one thing if you do if you just remind yourself you don't think this is a negative thing death is not a negative thing it's the only thing which is added value to your life if you are here forever you would be unbearable yeah. <laughs> yes yes isn't it aren't yes. we glad everybody yes. dies one day if you just become conscious of this one thing that always you're conscious that i'm mortal you don't have to think i will die today we don't intend we want to live as far as possible just you know one day i will die if you just conscious of this one thing you will naturally become spiritual every day every moment if you remind yourself this is a brief life i'm mortal one day i will end just do this for two days and see you will become something truly fantastic within yourself just this is all <laughs> and is simply beautiful that's all that's needed if you want to know the value of life just know that it's a brief happening so what about this obsession with ram and this frenzy over the ram temple which of course now is going to be inaugurated where do you find this isn't it then misplaced i don't know i wouldn't use those words they're very strong words obsession frenzy all this because if somebody has to be an inspiration after 7 8000 years there must be some element there not for one or two people for millions and millions of people if someone has to be an inspiration after thousands of years there must be something if we don't see that something then we will say it's an obsession it is this that What but let me let me come to this and anyway coming to the ram temple 
So Ram had a series of problems during his life. Even after thousands of years, he still has real estate issues. His real estate is not settled after thousands of years. So people who love him want to settle that real estate. I think it's settled, Supreme Court has settled it. So they want to build a temple. It is devotion. Why should it be termed as frenzy and obsession? Is it, let me use another word which again you will say is strong, isn't it divisive? Why is it divisive? Because it cuts across two communities. Really? It's been a bloody tale. And by bloody, I mean a tale of blood, <laughs> a tale of killings, a tale of rights. What's happened in the last 800 years is the bloodiest tale that's ever happened in any part of the world ever. What happened to the Jews with Adolf Hitler? What happened to Native Americans with North America? What happened in Cambodia? All these things are nothing compared to what happened in India in these 800 years. And if you don't think that is bloody, and there is no any kind of remorse in people who committed those things, then just people want a small piece of real estate back for their asta, and that is divisive. Why is it divisive? I mark that you are using the word real estate and not temple. Is that deliberate? It is. It is real estate. But temple is built by devotees' hearts. The land is just real estate. But it's sacred for them because it is identified as a birthplace and obviously there's no question mark whether there was a temple or not. It is not one temple. Thousands of temples were raised because that's the policy that it must be raised and it will be raised in future also. If we don't protect it, it will be raised in future also. Even now in Pakistan, Bangladesh is happening. Why should it be divisive? Why can't everybody settle down to whatever nonsense they believe in and do their stuff? I can live without any belief system, but maybe people need some belief systems, so they have their beliefs. But how come I think my belief is right and yours is wrong and you must die just for believing whatever I don't believe? If you don't address that and you say all these words, it's just, what is this? <laughs> Where does this come from? <laughs> you spoke about the past, you spoke about past wars. Do two wrongs make a right? See, there are no two wrongs. It's just a request. These three icons, Shiva, Rama, Krishna, Thousands have been… Dem uh, temples have been demolished. Nobody is asking because it's impossible to refix the history and nobody thinks it can be… we can refix the history, nor is anybody interested. These three icons where their… Uh, you know, the basic presence was, these three iconic places they are asking for, why can't it be just offered without a fight? Where is a fight? And nobody is fighting, they are only going to the court. Court is not a fight, it's a legal process. Why are you calling legal process a co uh, fight? You have never prayed in your life or gone to a temple or have you gone and when did you stop going and have you read the scriptures? I have definitely not read the scriptures. I am not a temple going person, I have built temples but I yes, don't go ones. there. If I go to a temple, if there is… See, our temples are not places of prayer. This is something that people have completely missed. Probably in the north, it's completely gone. In southern India, still the instructions are there. Here the instructions are, in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, if you go to your temple, nobody told you, you must pray, you must appeal to the god and this and that. If you go there, you must sit quietly in one place, because these are different types of energies. Consecrations are of different types. Each deity is consecrated in a certain way to open certain dimensions of your life. So you are supposed to sit there and imbibe that. Even in north, they only told you to have darshan, not have appeal, isn't it? Darshan means, because it's an energetic form, you take that impression into your mind and your heart. This will transform you. Because it's an energetic form, the physical form is just like a scaffolding. It is there, it is necessary for the visual apparatus, but it's the energetic form you're supposed to imbibe it. Because in this civilization that you refer to as Hindu right now, 
which unfortunately has been so badly distorted or let's say probably more appropriate word would be Sanatan, but that also has become a bad word today. Sanatan means eternal. So in this culture, nothing can be eternal unless it's all-inclusive. In this culture, there is no such thing as prayer. In this culture, there is darshan. In this culture, the aspiration is to not to go to heaven and sit with God. In this culture, the aspiration is to become divine. The aspiration is to become divine. Because what we consider as divine is something that's risen above what we normally think is human action-reaction kind of life. See, for example, many people, even in newspapers it's being written, Tendulkar is cricketing God. Because in people's mind, at least during his time, it's still so, whatever we thought was humanly possible, he rose beyond that, just hitting a damn ball, that's all. People but, say Sadhguru is God, your followers uh, say Sadhguru is no, God. No, nobody says that. They put me to work every day <laughs> So, when they say he is God, they're not saying he lives in heaven or some nonsense. They are saying he is, he is risen above what we think is human ceiling. He's risen about that. This is how we worshipped Rama, Krishna, everybody. They rose beyond their limitations, no matter what life throws at them. Even in a battlefield, they're cool. Even in a battlefield, he's joking. So we bow down to him when everybody's terrified of life and death. Somebody is above that means we'll bow down to me. Even now, suppose in India ma army, there is one major or one colonel or somebody, even in bullets are flying, he's just cool. Everybody will worship him because he's risen in some way. So in this culture, we are not wanting to go to God. We want to become that. But our idea is not the God. We see everything as God, we'll bow down to a tree, we'll bow down to a cow, we'll bow down to a snake, we'll bow down to a rock, man, woman, child, anything. Because no piece of life is happening without the source of creation throbbing in it. If you recognize it, you bow down. If you don't, you don't. This… I do not know anything has grown to such a size, it's like, you know, my mind is… Billions of questions, simply. I have a question mark about everything in the universe and not a single answer. So then after thirty-five, forty minutes, he got so frustrated, he came and held me by the shoulders, shook me violently like this and he said, you must either be the divine or the devil, I think you're the later. I did not feel abused by this or insulted by this. Till then my problem was, what is this, what is that, what is that, what is that, what is that? One thing was clear to me, this is me. Suddenly this guy confused me about this also. <laughs> Suddenly I looked like this, what am I? Am I divine, am I devil, what the hell am I? <laughs> he just confused me for the first time, I thought this was clear. So I tried to stare at myself, it didn't work, so I closed my eyes. Initially minutes to hours it went on. One day I closed my eyes and sat. I thought I sat there for twenty-five, thirty minutes. When I opened my eyes, there's a huge crowd around me, India being what it is, there are garlands around me, around my neck, people are pulling my legs. They want to know, well, somebody wants to know about his business, somebody wants to know when his daughters will get married. I said, what the hell, where did you all come from? They said, you've been sitting here for thirteen days. In my experience, it was only twenty-five, thirty minutes. When I tried to open my legs, my knees were stuck. It took almost an hour and a half putting hot water, massage, everything to get my legs straightened out. Otherwise even I wouldn't have believed it, but thirteen days had passed. In my experience, it just felt like twenty-five, thirty minutes. And suddenly, what is inside, what is outside, everything got mixed up. Clearly till then, I was very clear, this is me, that's you, all right? I had no issue with that one, but this is me and that is you. 
Suddenly, uh, this idea of what is me and what is not me got all mixed up because what is me was just everywhere. Now, this looks like a hallucination and that's what I thought. I thought I'm just losing, you know, going off my rocker. I'm just losing my mind. But every cell in my body is bursting with ecstasy. One thing I know is I don't want to lose it. It may be madness, but I don't want to lose it. So right now, my whole effort with life is to just rub off that madness on you. You should also know the ecstasy of being alive. Right now, you know the torture of your intellect. You must know the ecstasy of being alive. You… you are a piece of life. Rest is all arrangements, yes or no? Why did you make these arrangements? To enhance your life. No, no, you made these arrangements mainly to enhance this life. You thought with education your life would enhance itself, with money it would enhance itself, with marriage it would enhance itself, with children it would enhance itself. Now you started the question, you know, this… I wanted to come and meditate but my family, my children, da-da-da, as if it's a problem. These are accessories that you added to enhance your life, not to put your life down. Yes? Every arrangement that you made is about enhancing this life, isn't it? If this life could be enhanced from outside, you would have done it. But this is a realization for you that life cannot be enhanced from outside. Arrangements will bring convenience and comfort. It'll take care of things for us, around us, but it cannot enhance. If you want to enhance that life, you have to turn inward. If you really care for people who are with you, your family, your children, the foremost thing that you need to do is you have to enhance this. Because what is the damn best thing that you can do to people around you? That you are a wonderful human being. There's nothing better you can do to them. If you had a choice, either to live or work with joyful and blissful human beings or work and live with miserable human beings, what is your choice? Blissful. I want you to please, please, please remember, everybody else is looking forward to the same thing. <laughs> you think other people want miserable people? No, please just give them that much, that you are a joyful human being. Thank you very much. I would like to once again acknowledge the Dharma Foundation for the commendable cause that they have taken up. This will be an important step for preserving and nurturing the future generations in a certain way. The significance of this is not to spread another new religion, the significance of this to create a, a religious world but still deeply spiritual world. This is very important. This is very, very important. The divide of religions, you see what it is causing. In the past it has done terrible things, still samples of that happening in many parts of the world, what the religious divide can do. Don't think you will be or I will be or our children will be immune to this. Anywhere it can flare up, believe me anywhere. So this effort is commendable and in whichever way we can support this Isha Foundation and myself, we will uh, put our force behind this. Thank you very much for being here. If you are capable of causing depression to yourself, I am saying this not without any concern for your illness, or not due to lack of compassion, because that is the nature of what's happening to you. If you're causing depression to yourself, you are able to generate substantial amount of intense emotions and thoughts, but in the wrong direction. If you don't have very strong emotions, very intense thoughts about something, you cannot get depressed. It is just that 
you are generating thoughts and emotion which work against you, not for you. So you are strong enough to cause depression to yourself because for you to cause a mental illness for yourself, unless you're pathologically ill, which is just a small number of people, rest are all self-created. Most of them are self-created. A few are pathologically ill, it's… they cannot help it. It just comes from within because of genetic and other factors. Almost everybody here, if we train them towards a certain kind of thought process and emotion and push them a little bit with the outside situations, almost everybody will go lose their mental balance they will become clinically ill. They can be driven to madness, I'm saying, because the line between sanity and insanity is very thin. People keep pushing it. You get angry, you're pushing the line. It's a thin line. In fact, when you get angry, you know you're pushing the line. That's why the expression, I was mad at somebody. You're not mad at somebody, you're just going mad. You cannot be mad at somebody. You're just pushing your sanity, the boundaries of sanity and moving into insanity for a certain period of time and coming back. You do one thing, every day you try this, ten minutes a day, try intense anger on somebody. What? You will see in three months time, you will be clinically there. Yes. Just try it if you want. Because if you keep pushing the line, you go mad and you come back, you go mad and you come back, one day you're not able to come back, that's all. One day you're not able to turn back, then you're clinically ill. You must understand even if you got angry for a moment, you're already ill. Maybe you don't get the certificate of diagnosis. They don't slap a certificate on you that you are gone, but you are going, isn't it? You think it's your right to throw tantrums? You think it's your right to get angry with people? You think it's your privilege to be depressed so that you'll get attention from somebody? You keep playing this, one day you will not, able, you will not be able to turn back. Keep crossing the line every day, one day you will see you cannot cross back. That day you need a doctor. Till then, everybody needed a respite from you. But the day you can't cross back, they get the respite because now they can catch you and give you to a doctor. Otherwise, you're temporarily going mad every day, many times a day. They cannot even send you to an asylum. They have to bear with you, your family, your friends, your people around. If you get at least truly clinically ill, we can hand you over. There's one temple in Tamil Nadu, you know, where they chain you and keep you. Where there is no hospital, no psychological for ailments, there is no hospital, there is a temple that somebody created which is supposed to push people back into sanity. So, families just take them and leave them there, they're shackled and left in the temple. You give them some money, they'll feed you and you're just there like an animal, tied up. I think if hospitals were run like this, lot of people wouldn't go crazy. They would maintain their sanity. <laughs> right now it's too deluxe. <laughs> if you make hospital extremely comfortable, it'll become an incentive to become sick. 
and you have incentives in your life to become ill, right from your childhood. You got the maximum attention only when you fell ill. When you are happy, they screamed at you. When you sque squealed in joy, they screamed back at you, adults. You then boo 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 boo. When you are a child, physical illness is good because you'll get attention from your mother and father and everybody around you and you don't have to go to school on that day. <laughs> so you learn the art of falling physically ill. But once you get married, you learn the art of becoming mentally ill. Because if you want to get attention, you go sit in a corner act depressed, people will pay attention to you. So, you pl keep playing this game, one day you're not able to cross the line back. That day you're clinically ill. Unfortunately, in many ways, not just in the way that I said now, in many different ways, I would say seventy percent of illnesses on the planet, all kinds, are self-created. Even if you get an infection, there is a way. If you keep yourself in a certain way, physically and mentally, the virus and the bacteria will not work the same way as it works upon somebody else. If you set yourself like this, no matter what's happening, anyway, I have to go and do this, this and this. There's no break from that. The last twenty-nine years, I have not been able to cancel one program because I'm running temperature, I got a cold, I got this, I got that. It doesn't matter what's happening, what you have to do, you anyway have to do. You can't turn back on that. Either out of your commitment or you have a boss like that. One or one way or the other, if it happens, then you will see, you will not at all fall sick so often. Because if you have temperature, you still have to go. If it's summer, you still go, right? No, a lot of people don't go. It's a little hot outside, they don't go and work. <laughs> little cold outside, they don't go and work. A little raining, they won't go and work. A snowflake, they will not go and work. This is just weather. So for every change in weather, if you have the comfort of covering yourself in a blanket and lying down, once you create that, your body will learn to fall sick as often as possible. If you just keep it this way, it doesn't matter what it is, anyway I have to go and do what I have to do, you will see your body will just bounce back as quickly as possible, even if it gets the worst kind of infections. So, you just have to set the necessary conditions for health, necessary in incentives for health, both for yourself and your children if you have them. Do not set incentives for sickness. <coughs> the child is sick, observe him from a distance, never go curl him. He knows that's the worst time of his life and he knows he has to get well soon. And give him the best attention when he is joyful. You will see, he naturally learns from within. His very chemistry will learn that it pays to be joyful, it doesn't pay to be sick. If you make this very clear to your own biology, to your own chemistry and to everybody around you, you will see people will not fall sick as often as they are right now. So set that up for yourself, you will see you will get healthy. If you can turn your mind this way, you can also turn it this way, I want you to understand this. No, no, I am like this because my father abused me when I was seven years of age. If you know all that bullshit, you can as well turn yourself around, isn't it? It's time. You must understand, mentally, physiologically, 
chemically, energy-wise, you must clearly understand it doesn't pay to be sick, unhappy, depressed, it doesn't pay. To be joyful and ecstatic, it pays. If you make this clear to all these people inside, they will all behave properly. Continue your quest for wisdom and personal growth. Explore more videos on our channel and share your journey with us.